Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. The events on the Korean Peninsula don't take place in a vacuum. They are influenced by the great powers that have a stake in the region. The People's Republic of China, in particular, makes its weight felt. It is the largest trade partner of both Korean states and considered by many to be the linchpin in the international disputes surrounding North Korea. But while China has long been reluctant to put pressure on Pyongyang, recent developments in the North Korean nuclear program have seemingly led it to reconsider its position. To better understand China's foreign policy since Xi Jinping became president three years ago, and its position with regards to North Korea, we had the honor of meeting with Bonnie Glazer. She spoke to us about the growing assertiveness of China in international affairs, the role its president plays in these changes, China's perception of North Korea, and the future prospects for the region. Bonnie Glazer is a senior advisor for Asia and the director of the China Power Project at CSIS. Previously, she served as a consultant for various U.S. government offices, including the Departments of Defense and State. Her writings have been published in various academic journals and newspapers, including the China Quarterly, Asian Survey, and International Security, as well as in the New York Times. Bonnie Glazer received her BA in Political Science from Boston University and her MA with concentrations in International Economics and Chinese Studies from the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Bonnie Glazer, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you for having me on your show. For the past decades, you have been researching, writing about, and advising on China and its foreign policy. What was it that initially sparked your interest in the People's Republic of China? I started attending university in 1976, and at that time, it was a few years after President Nixon had been to China. China seemed like it was going to present a lot of opportunities. And I was interested in studying a part of the world that was quite different from the country that I came from. It had a very different culture, language, different history. And I designed my major around China as a case study of modernization and tried to take classes in all different aspects uh, of China, including its philosophy, its geography, and its politics and foreign policy. And uh, I don't think it was a wrong choice. China became a very big issue in a very, I think, positive way. People started traveling to China. China's economy started growing. And then in more recent years, we have seen China presenting some security challenges. It's been more than three years since Xi Jinping became president of the People's Republic of China. In your assessment, have we seen a new kind of Chinese foreign policy since then? Well, I think Chinese foreign policy really began to change before Xi Jinping came to power under Hu Jintao. In 2009, when Hu Jintao was president of China, the Chinese started to adopt a more assertive foreign policy on a number of issues. Up until that time, Chinese foreign policy had long been guided by a principle that was enunciated by Deng Xiaoping in the probably early 90s that is often translated as a keeping a low profile. And in about 2009, China started to move away from this principle and adopt a more activist foreign policy. And this coincided with the onset of the global financial crisis. And I believe that there was an assessment in Beijing at the time that the United States was entering into a period of decline, that it would be gradual, but that ultimately China would rise and eventually overtake the United States. And so I think this led to China becoming overconfident and beginning to, particularly in maritime areas around its periphery, involving Japan, for example, in 2010, where there was an incident with a Chinese fisherman who was allegedly drunk. He was uh, inside the 12 nautical mile territorial sea area around the disputed islands that uh, are in the East China Sea, which the Japanese call the Senkakus and the Chinese call the uh, Diaoyu Islands. 
and the Japanese arrested this fisherman after he rammed a Japanese Coast Guard ship. And it took many months before the Japanese eventually released the captain, first the crew and then later the captain. But the Chinese started to put pressure on Japan by arresting some businessmen who were in China at the time, and then by restricting the export of rare earth minerals uh, to Japan. So this was a new China using some of its economic clout for coercive purposes against a country. So it's my view that this assertive nature more activist Chinese foreign policy really began under Hu Jintao. Now, when Xi Jinping took power, which, of course, he became head of the party in November of 2012, and uh, he was, in fact, put in charge of a leading small group in September of that year in 2012 that was in charge of maritime issues, including both East China Sea and South China Sea, there was another incident with Japan in September of 2012 where the Japanese government bought three of the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands, and the Chinese once again reacted in an assertive way and started to send their own Coast Guard ships inside the territorial sea. Subsequently, the following year, announced the Chinese announced an air defense identification zone over the East China Sea. So we can see that Xi Jinping, even before he came to power, appeared to be leading an effort to advance China's territorial claims. Now, since Xi Jinping became president really very early after he assumed the position of general secretary of the party, he started to talk about his vision, which he called the Chinese dream. And this was really rejuvenating the Chinese nation, making China great again, because in Chinese history, as they teach the citizens of the People's Republic, China was a great nation. But then there was this period they call the century of national humiliation. It's really about a century and a half, but it really started with the Opium Wars in the middle of the 19th century, and China was exploited by foreign governments. It wasn't occupied, but certainly uh, they had war with Japan in the 30s, later World War II. There were many countries that had areas that they controlled around Shanghai, for example. So the Chinese, I think, now believe it's this um, sense of rising nationalism. The time has come to retake their rightful place in the world. As the Chinese saw themselves as weak, they didn't feel they had the capability to try and press forward claims that they had, even though they have long talked about the fact that they have these near seas, the East China Sea, the Yellow Sea, the South China Sea, all belong to China. This was a mere statement. In the mid-1990s, the Chinese talked about how alliances in the Asia-Pacific region were Cold War relics, but they really didn't do anything about this because they didn't have the capability So what's new under this new rising China, which began again under Hu Jintao, but has been accelerated under Xi Jinping, is the development of capabilities to begin to put pressure on other countries to recognize that China has these claims, particularly territorial claims, and this is water as well as land, but also that the Chinese want the neighboring countries to see that China is the the rightful dominant power in this region, and that other countries should show deference to Chinese interests. And the Chinese believe they're much bigger, other countries are smaller, and their interests just matter more. So Xi Jinping, I think, really started to push forward this insistence on respecting Chinese interests in a way that Hu Jintao did not. Under Hu Jintao, China very rarely had tensions with more than one country at a time. If uh, things weren't going well with the United States, China had good relations with Japan, with Russia. But now under Xi Jinping, we see a willingness to tolerate a high level of friction with a large number of countries. So as China is asserting its claims in the South China Sea, China has friction to varying degrees with the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, 
and other countries who are not claimants, where this is still an issue, like even Singapore, and tension with Japan is still high, it ebbs and flows. So this is something new under Xi Jinping. Tension with the United States at times has been fairly high. I think that Xi Jinping continues to attach great importance to the U.S.-China relationship and wants to keep it in a normal, positive place if he can. But the importance of relations with China's neighbors has grown under Xi Jinping. Hu Jintao always talked about relationship with the United States is very important. And even before him, Jiang Zemin used to say that the relationship with the United States was the most important of the most important. (laughs) Xi Jinping does not use those kinds of words. And even his call for a new type of major power relationship with the United States, which he first put forward when he was vice president and visited the U.S. in February of 2012, even that is sometimes extended to include other powers. Russia didn't want to be left out, and so Sometimes Xi Jinping uh, has talked about the new type of great power relationship or major country relationship, as the Chinese like to call it, as including other major powers. But it's really primarily, I think, focused on the United States. So another trend in Chinese foreign policy that's worth paying attention to is that China has become more active in more positive ways. Before Xi Jinping was president, there was a reluctance to get involved overseas unless China's interests were very closely connected to some development abroad. The Chinese never wanted to be a leader, really, in anything. They believed that getting embroiled in conflict abroad could end up distracting China from its main focus on national development. For Xi Jinping, of course, national development is still the highest priority, and keeping the Chinese Communist Party in power is really the top priority. But foreign policy seems to be more important for Xi Jinping. He wants China to play a more positive role, contributing to global development, to peacekeeping. China has expanded its contribution to the United Nations, and the number of uh, peacekeeping troops has certainly risen. Xi Jinping has traveled more than any other Chinese leader. He spends an enormous amount of time traveling all over the world, promoting China's image, its relations with other nations, and trying to enhance China's standing. He wants other countries, again, to recognize the growing importance of China. Xi Jinping is also quite strategic in many ways. One example of a great strategy that he has put forward is this notion of the one belt, one road. And what he's really done is taken a pre-existing series of relationships that China has had with other countries where they have contributed to growing infrastructure projects in many countries in China's periphery and said, let's just take all of these together and make it into a new project, a new strategy, and then let's develop it further, include new countries, and reinvent the Silk Road, and take it all the way to Europe, and then we'll have on the eastern side, well, this maritime road that we'll call the Silk Road as well, and so it's the belt and the road, or it's the maritime road. And this is an effort, I think, to restore China's influence and dominance in the region. That Xi Jinping wants China to be seen as the center of all of activity and growth and development and rulemaking in the Asia-Pacific region. So I think it's really quite ambitious. It dovetails quite nicely with the fact that the Chinese have a great deal of excessive capital domestically that probably will not be able to find lucrative investments at home. And so they need to go abroad in order to invest. And so companies are now, instead of constructing buildings in China that nobody can live in, and there are many vacant buildings in many cities in China, so now these construction companies can go abroad, collaborate with other 
companies and in other places outside of China's borders. And so it has economic, political, and strategic consequences. So I think this has been a very important part of China's foreign policy as well. How much of that is due to Xi Jinping, the man, and how much of that is due to the government as it now is, the constitution of the uh, Communist Party in China? Well, I think that uh, really what is driving the changes in Chinese foreign policy are in part due to Xi Jinping, the man, but they are in part due to growing nationalism in China, the fact that the Chinese people seem to want their leadership to defend Chinese interests, so public opinion has become more important. As I said, just growing capabilities. The Chinese now have Navy ships and Coast Guard ships that can go sail in the East China Sea and the South China Sea and try to protect and advance Chinese interests. They didn't have this in the past. So I think capabilities are very important as well. There's also security concerns. The fact that the United States has enunciated this rebalance to Asia under President Obama is very much seen as a threat by China. So this has driven the development of more military capabilities as well as more active diplomacy to try and fend off U.S. influence in the region and tighten China's relations with its neighbors although the Chinese think sometimes they can do that through economic means alone, and they really can't, because so many of those countries will look to the United States to be a security balancer in the region because they feel some threats from the uncertainty about China's rise. I mean, nobody really knows what China will be like if and when it becomes a, a major superpower. But I think that Xi Jinping himself as an individual is important as well. Uh, and if you read Xi Jinping's speeches, you can pay attention to the fact that he emphasizes, for example, that China should never give up an inch of territory. That's fascinating because under previous Chinese leaders, China had territorial disputes with many of its neighbors that surround it on its land borders. So China has 14 countries that are contiguous with its territory with, on, on land. And over the last uh, several decades, China has negotiated agreements and resolved these territorial disputes. And uh, Russia is a very good example, which, of course, it dates back to the Soviet Union. And it took decades, but they resolved their territorial dispute. And China used to have a principle of mutual compromise, and some of these land disputes were settled through give and take. In some cases, the Chinese gave up territory. Today, we don't hear Xi Jinping offering any kind of compromise with any of his neighbors. He believes that China's sovereignty claims can never be compromised. And I think this is part of Xi Jinping, the individual, that he's the great leader of China that's now going to defend Chinese interests. I think that the more activist approach getting involved to some extent, even in, even in the Middle East, where China's sort of just putting its toe in the water. They don't quite know yet what role they want to play. Growing involvement in Africa as well. I think that this has been in part encouraged by Xi Jinping. He wants China to play a bigger role in the world. And he's spoken at conferences and at the United Nations about the growing importance and relevance of China to the world. His confidence is really quite remarkable. And I've heard from foreign leaders who have met with him many times that he comes across in private conversations as extremely confident. He knows what he wants and how to get there. Now, the Chinese economy is slowing down and uh, China's leading this intense anti-corruption campaign, which Xi Jinping has launched. And I have to believe that he really doesn't have all that much certainty that he's going to be able to achieve the goals that he wants to achieve. You know, China's now growing at about 6.5% a year. That's quite a slowdown from the double-digit growth that China had for a long time. And, of course, it was inevitable that China was going to slow down. It was actually quite unusual that any country could sustain that rate of growth for so long. But China's leaders have 
really had a pact with the Chinese people. They have to deliver growth and a higher standard of living. And in turn, the Chinese people generally have not demanded a great deal of political participation. And some people wonder whether that pact will break down in the future. And Xi Jinping, I think, knows that he must deliver a quality economic growth, not just quantity. And so there is this effort now to shift the economic model away from an investment and export-driven model to one that is more consumption-driven. And I think that this is a huge challenge for Xi Jinping. And after he finishes his first five-year term, uh, he will serve another five-year term. He will have the opportunity to put his own people on the standing committee of the Politburo. And so many people think this is a critical juncture for him, that if he can stack the standing committee, that he will be able to move more quickly in implementing economic reforms. He may also implement a more, even more assertive foreign policy. We have yet to see that. I think that from what I hear from some people in China, Xi Jinping has made some decisions in a rash manner where he has not adequately consulted experts in China. The air defense identification zone that I mentioned earlier in the East China Sea would be one example of that. Perhaps the way he is managing the South China Sea and the decision to build artificial islands and begin to put some dual-use capabilities on them and potentially militarize them, that may be another example where the Navy pressed Xi Jinping early on to agree to this plan to build these seven artificial islands in, in the Spratly chain. And I think Xi Jinping wanted to have the People's Liberation Army on his side. He needed the military support, and maybe that was the reason why he approved it. There are some rumors that this Navy blueprint was put forward under Hu Jintao, but was rejected. There were other things that were rejected under Hu Jintao. Pressure on the leadership to abandon Deng Xiaoping's guideline of Tao Guangyang Hui, of keeping a low profile. Hu Jintao resisted jettisoning that policy. But Xi Jinping apparently has, although it has never been officially announced, it's quite clear that this is not a guideline for foreign policy any longer. And some people think that that may have been somewhat premature. When China talked about peaceful rise in the 2003 to sort of 2012 period, that got a lot of support internationally. People thought they were reassured, I think, by the fact that Chinese leaders talked about a peaceful rise. Xi Jinping doesn't talk about a peaceful rise. Not that he talks about using force, but he, uh, he doesn't talk about China putting its interests in a subordinate position uh, to uh, other nations. Xi Jinping, the man, the individual, the personality, and his vision... I think, uh, I think are important in influencing what China is doing both in its domestic policy and its foreign policy. Let's now zoom in on one part of China's neighborhood, the Korean Peninsula. Last year, you co-wrote a paper with Yun Swan in which you argued that China has three primary interests regarding the Korean Peninsula, peace, stability, and denuclearization. This approach sounds highly pragmatic, does it mean that the Chinese approach to the Korean Peninsula is driven first and foremost by a, so to speak, egocentric cost-benefit calculation and not by ideology or other factors such as the promotion of human rights? Well, I don't think that China's policy today toward the Korean Peninsula is driven by ideology. In fact, I don't think there is an ideological factor in China's foreign policy really at all today. It is really um, based on hard national interests. And China's interests are certainly in preventing war, first and foremost, on the Korean Peninsula. Having experienced a terrible war that China was involved in, in supporting North Korea in the 1950s, the Chinese do not want to go to war again on the Korean Peninsula. And they certainly don't want to have a war with South Korea and the United States. So the preservation of peace is critical. Uh, the preservation of peace really around all of China's borders is critical because it's only in a peaceful environment that China can focus on its own economic development. 
Secondly, the preservation of stability, I think, is very important. The Chinese, I think, worry about the potential for instability in North Korea, the possibility that there could be particularly political instability. Economic instability is manageable because the Chinese can provide food. They can provide assistance. They don't think that economic instability would bring down the regime in North Korea. But they know from their own experience that if you have political instability, you have a fracturing at the top of a uh, government or a, the Communist Party, that that can lead to infighting, even factions in the military that might fight each other. And the reason why the Chinese fear this taking place in North Korea, I believe, is not really primarily because of the risk of refugees. Many people state that China is fearful of refugees flowing across the border. And of course, it's a concern. But the Chinese have the capability to manage that kind of a threat. They exercise the possibility of shutting down the border if they have to. Some people say that they might even set up refugee camps and try to keep people either on the Korean side of the border or possibly inside China. But this is a manageable threat compared to the real danger, and that is that the United States and South Korea might take advantage of instability in North Korea in order to unify the country. And there's a great deal of uncertainty in China about what unification would be like, what its implications would be for China's interests. And although there is a great deal of downside from the current situation, North Korea increasingly poses a liability for China. Its nuclear program, its provocations, the fact that it is in some ways unfriendly towards China, and there is even that risk that North Korea could become hostile toward China. But the current situation is known. This status quo is something that China understands and feel it has some influence over, and it can protect its interests from being seriously damaged. Unification, the Chinese just don't know whether that would mean that the U.S. ROC alliance would be more threatening to China than it is today, whether American forces might be deployed north of the 38th parallel whether there might be some way in which the alliance could be used to damage Chinese interests, maybe even extend to Taiwan. I think that the Chinese are really quite fearful of the uncertainty. And as a result, this preservation of stability is very, very important for China. So the Chinese would rather have a North Korea that is not only stable, but is also pursuing economic reform integrated into the region, a North Korea that has normal diplomatic relations with Japan and the United States, good ties with South Korea. This is China's ideal, but it is China is increasingly pessimistic about this ever being achieved, and particularly under Kim Jong-un. Under Kim Jong-il, I think the Chinese had somewhat more hope. They would take Kim Jong-il to their special economic zones and show him how economic reform in China had produced such success. And the message there was, you too can have this kind of economic success. And the Chinese held out hope that a top-down process of economic reform could transform North Korea and ensure that North Korea would remain intact and perhaps even narrow the gap in ways with uh, South Korea's uh, economy. This would have been, I think, potentially just much more politically desirable for China. But in the current situation, I think the Chinese fear instability and they want to prevent the United States or South Korea from taking advantage of any instability that might take place. The third goal, which sometimes the Chinese call their top priority of denuclearization, I think is real. I think that the Chinese do not want to see nuclear weapons in North Korea. They wish that this whole program could be eliminated. They would prefer if North Korea did not develop long-range missiles that could potentially deliver nuclear weapons. 
And again, the primary threat here is that if North Korea creates a crisis by proliferating nuclear weapons or having the capability to place a warhead on a missile and deliver it to the United States, it might provoke a reaction from the U.S. that could threaten China's security. Or if North Korea engages in a conventional provocation against South Korea and provokes a a reaction, the U.S. could also be drawn in. And once again, we have the prospect for reunification and American troops that could be along China's uh, northeastern border. So nuclear weapons don't bring anything positive from China's perspective. There might be circumstances in which China would be willing to live with them, very small number, and the United States and South Korea accepted that they would continue to exist. I think that's highly unlikely. I don't think that there's the prospects for a U.S. government any time in the near future recognizing North Korea as a nuclear weapon state. But I think there are some scenarios in which China could accept that, but only if the United States and South Korea did. So denuclearization, stability, and peace are all intertwined. They're not distinct, separate stases for China's perspective because denuclearization is something they would like to achieve, but they're not willing to put so much pressure on North Korea to denuclearize that they could end up forcing or creating in North Korea an unstable situation. And if the nuclear program continues, the reaction of other countries like the United States will always pose this danger of possible instability and maybe even possible war. If nuclear weapons in North Korea become an existential threat to the United States, we don't know what the United States will do. So these three elements of peace and stability and denuclearization I think are critically important for China's security. And I I don't know that it's which one is number one or number two, because I think they're all inextricably linked. Going back to Xi Jinping's assertiveness, how did that play out with North Korea? And especially with regards to South Korea, which now many observers are saying is a more important interest for China than North Korea is. Xi Jinping has been willing to signal North Korea that he will not tolerate this nuclear program. And he has done so by severely restricting the high-level visits. We have not seen Xi Jinping meet with Kim Jong-un, which is remarkable since all Chinese leaders have met with North Korea's leader. There have been very few other high-level visits Xi Jinping has also signaled his dissatisfaction through the willingness to sign on to tougher and tougher UN Security Council resolutions. And after the fourth nuclear test, for the first time, China has agreed to economic sanctions on North Korea, which the Chinese have long said they would never, ever support. So that is, I think, in part a function of Xi Jinping's willingness to take a much harsher set of measures to signal North Korea that China is quite serious about opposing its nuclear weapons program. Xi Jinping has also been willing to develop relations with South Korea in ways that his predecessors really did not do, so that the gap now between China's relationship with North Korea and South Korea, the difference could not be starker. It's just a huge difference. The interactions between China and South Korea, the level of trade and people-to-people exchanges has just exploded. Xi Jinping has met, I think it's eight times, with President Park. There's now military agreements and even uh, hotlines between uh, the militaries. There's uh, now negotiations about fishing and demarcation of the maritime boundary. These are all things that I think are really quite surprising, that the relationship has really advanced in a direction and, and at a pace that I think very few really, really uh, expected. And of course, it's partially a function of Seoul's willingness to reach out to China and forge this closer relationship. 
And uh, prior Chinese leaders, I think, have been careful to balance the relationships with North Korea and South Korea, always wanting to maintain good relations with both. And Xi Jinping seems to have completely rejected that principle in Chinese foreign policy. He does not want a hostile relationship with North Korea, but he is not willing to refrain from doing things with South Korea just because they would anger North Korea. And I think that's a remarkable difference between him and previous Chinese leaders. Sanctions have been a hotly debated topic between China and the rest of the world when it comes to North Korea. Yet if China values stability on the Korean Peninsula, doesn't that mean that sanctions, enforced sanctions, might actually be a gamble about whether or not North Korea would collapse or not as a result? From China's perspective, giving North Korea positive inducements, which is what they did for many, many years, has not produced the outcome they want. And so Beijing has recognized that there must be a combination of carrots and sticks. The sticks are the sanctions. And the Chinese had hoped that very limited sanctions, targeted sanctions, would be enough. But they haven't worked. So this is why the Chinese now believe that there is a need to increase the pressure. At the same time, I think they worry that this increased pressure could lead to instability. So I expect that as the Chinese implement these sanctions, which include, of course, banning luxury goods, for example, to North Korea, and that ban actually has been in place under prior UN Security Council resolutions, but the Chinese simply did not enforce it, and curtailing the import of minerals, and in particular banning the import of coal and iron ore. This will deny foreign exchange to senior North Korean leaders. And shutting down the banking system, which has worked along the border in northeast China, despite previous sanctions that were supposed to shut down the ability of North Korea to engage in financial transactions, the Chinese are now getting serious about this. And so I think that what they will do is they will try to monitor the situation inside North Korea to the best of their ability. And if they detect that there is a potential for political instability that could lead to the regime being in danger, I think that the Chinese will back away from the implementation of sanctions. At least we will see that they will become more lax. The Chinese have spoken, I think, quite clearly and openly about their persistent concerns about instability. Even when the UN Security Council Resolution 2270 was passed, the Chinese ambassador to the United Nations spoke about China's concerns about the potential for instability. So they are quite transparent about that concern. At present, they say that they are going to implement these sanctions, but we will just have to see going forward whether they implement it strictly, if so, how strictly, will they implement some of these of these sanctions but not others, or will they actually cooperate with the rest of the international community and really test the proposition, which has never really been tested, that denying the elite access to foreign exchange, access to luxury goods, and making them really hurt might cause the leadership, and of course, Kim Jong-un personally, to reconsider whether or not continuing down the nuclear path is in North Korea's interest. Two years ago, Xi Jinping declared that, and I quote, matters in Asia ultimately must be taken care of by Asians, and Asia security ultimately must be protected by Asians. Is this just a mere rhetoric targeted towards other part of the region, or does this have actual practical implications for China's foreign policy with regards to North Korea? Xi Jinping proposed what has come to be known as the Asia for Asians proposal. It was at the Conference for um, Interaction and Confidence Building Measures, what we refer to as SICA. This organization does not include many Western countries. And I think that Xi Jinping was testing the waters to see whether there might be interest and support in the region for a new security architecture, not centered on, of course, the United States and Western rules, 
but more on China as the center. This was something that the United States at the time was quite concerned about and raised with Xi Jinping. Uh, President Obama raised it, and Xi Jinping explained, and then, of course, officials later continued to explain that this did not mean that China seeks to push the U.S. out of the region. I think to this day, we really don't know what Xi Jinping really had in his mind, whether China ultimately wants to see the U.S. play less of a role in the region. Certainly, the Chinese continue to call for the end of U.S. alliances. And this includes the alliance, of course, with South Korea, with Japan. Certainly, the alliance with the Philippines is particularly objectionable these days to to the Chinese. But this Asia for Asians idea, I don't think, is necessarily connected with the idea of sanctioning North Korea or playing a greater role in a way that supports interference in internal affairs, which is really what sanctions on North Korea is. Even before Xi Jinping, the Chinese have been moving away from this non-interference principle, although in, sometimes they wrap themselves in it and insist that they don't interfere. But it's quite clear they are interfering, in my view, in North Korea, and for good reason, because it poses a threat to China. But I'm not sure that I see any real connection between this notion of a new regional security architecture and China's policy towards North Korea. Yesterday, you said during a panel discussion at the ASEAN Plenum here in Seoul that, to quote you, China wants North Korea to make a fundamental decision about its national strategy. Do you mean to say that China is running out of patience with North Korea? I do think Xi Jinping is running out of patience with North Korea. There is continuing assistance, of course, that goes from China to North Korea. This has gone on for many, many years. The Chinese will continue, even under the sanctions, to export oil to North Korea. There's food assistance. This is a, a line item in China's budget and has been for years. And I think that Xi Jinping expects that North Korea, in return, will respect Chinese interests, at least not threaten Chinese interests and again show deference to China. Kim Jong-un has not done that. In fact, what Kim Jong-un has done from China's perspective is just simply be defiant. And when Xi Jinping has sent messages to Kim Jong-un to not engage in provocations, those have been ignored. And they were ignored when Hu Jintao was president as well. And there were some sharp words that Hu Jintao used after the very first nuclear test in 2006. But Hu Jintao was not willing to support the really tough sanctions on the North Korean economy. And so this is the major departure under Xi Jinping. And I think it is in part because Xi himself is frustrated that although North Korea to some extent remains a buffer state between South Korea and China, and Beijing derives some benefit from that, that that benefit is increasingly being outweighed by the threats that North Korea poses to Chinese security, more indirect than direct. Again, I think it is how the United States and South Korea and maybe even Japan would react to North Korea's provocations than any direct threat by North Korea to China. I don't think that the Chinese really fear that North Korea would use its nuclear weapons against China. But they do fear a nuclear accident. The people who live along the border with North Korea are worried about contamination of the air and the soil. There have been many complaints on China's Weibo when North Korea has conducted uh, nuclear tests, and the Chinese government has tried to reassure its people by saying that it is sending scientists to test the air and the water and make sure that there has not been any negative consequences for security in northeast China. But I think that the people remain afraid. The nuclear test site is quite near China's border. So the fear of uh, some kind of contamination or radiation is really quite high. That would be one example of a more direct threat to Chinese security, even though, again, I don't think they fear that North Korea is going to use its nuclear weapons against China. 
But even if there is a small element of North Korea being an asset for China, I think this aspect of North Korea being a liability is growing and is already far greater than the benefits that China derives from having North Korea sit between South Korea and China. And the fact that China has grown and become a more confident power, its economy is so large and it is so much more active diplomatically, it has much more military capability than it had in the past, may mean that China will someday be willing to take that risk and allow North Korea to collapse. I don't think it would ever be the source of that collapse. It doesn't ever want the collapse to come from pressure from the outside. But if an implosion occurs for reasons that don't have anything to do with external actors, some people think that China would intervene, save North Korea, put in a new leader. And people often mention the fact that there is a clause in the treaty that was signed between China and North Korea that remains in place today that they would come to each other's assistance in the event of an attack. But it's my understanding that China has repeatedly, not only under Xi Jinping, but also under Hu Jintao, asked North Korea to excise this clause from the treaty, and the North Koreans have refused. And many Chinese scholars write and say publicly that they think that this aspect of the treaty is no longer operable. Chinese officials do not refer to North Korea as an ally. They talk sometimes about the traditional friendship, but then at increasingly higher levels, they are now noting that the relationship between China and North Korea is one of a normal state-to-state -state relationship. And Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi uh, said this for the first time at the National People's Congress that was held in March earlier this year. So I think that these are signals of growing impatience by China's president. And so far, the Chinese are willing to live with the danger and the risks and the uncertainty of the current situation, the status quo. They do feel that they can, to a large extent, prevent very serious harm to their security. Again, if you compare it to the uncertainty of reunification, but someday that could change. How does the evolution of China's perception of North Korea as an increasingly heavier burden plays out when it comes to dealing with the United States? Is North Korea a cause for dissension, or is it maybe a way to foster the new type of great powers relations China has been talking about so much recently? The Chinese have somewhat converging interests with the United States, but also diverging interests with the United States when it comes to North Korea. Clearly, the interest that they share is in denuclearization. But beyond that, what kind of government there should be in Korea, whether unification should take place, the kinds of roles that the U.S. should play on the peninsula, these are areas where the U.S. and China fundamentally disagree. And yet China wants the issue of North Korea to be on the positive side of the ledger in the U.S.-China relationship. And when the Chinese agreed to launch the six-party talks, this new mechanism enabled China to play a bit of a bigger role. They had to take on some responsibility, and the United States credited China for facilitating these talks. And so for many years, the North Korea issue really has been mostly in the positive side of the ledger. This has given the U.S. a little bit of leverage occasionally over Chinese policy on this issue. So after the last nuclear test, I think that the Chinese believed that the international response should follow the previous pattern, whereby the UN Security Council condemned it, and there was a new sanctions resolution that marginally tighter sanctions than had been agreed to before. But remaining quite far from the kinds of economic sanctions that have been used against Iran, for example, and just targeted against individual designated entities and individuals, and not much attention to enforcement. And the Chinese, I think, were quite shocked that the United States said, and Secretary Kerry was the one to state this publicly, 
we're not going to have business as usual with North Korea. And I believe that the Obama administration used its leverage well, coordinated effectively with South Korea, with Japan, put a lot of pressure on China to accept much more substantial sanctions than had previously been passed. And part of this reason, I think, is because China does want to keep North Korea in the cooperative column. It does not want to have too much dissension with the United States on this issue. In conclusion, what issues do you see as the litmus test for the trajectory of China's foreign policy in the future, especially with its relation with the United States, but also the Korean Peninsula? I think one of the most important litmus tests going forward for Chinese foreign policy is how it's going to handle territorial disputes with its neighbors, whether or not it is going to use diplomacy, whether it will stick to peaceful means, or whether it will ultimately use force. And a decision by China to use force would have profoundly negative ramifications for China's relations with its neighbors, even if it is a tiny rock in the South China Sea. Will China accept the rule-based order, international law, the UN Convention and the law of the sea to resolve the differences that it has with its neighbors? And I think that's a big question going forward, especially as we await the ruling of the arbitral tribunal in the case that the Philippines has brought against China in the Spratly Islands chain. So I think this is a very, very important litmus test. And the United States, I think, is closely watching how China is going to handle these disputes and whether China is going to accept a rules-based order. I myself do not see that China is trying to upend the entire international system. There are some people who are quite worried about whether China wants to replace the post-World War II international order. And I think there are aspects of the international order that China doesn't like and is seeking some changes on the margins. But there are other aspects that it has embraced, the United Nations probably being the most important institution of the post-World War II international order. And, and China is a strong supporter of the United Nations. So I think the real concern that I have is how China is going to act in the region. This is where China has the greatest leverage, where its security interests are deeply at stake, where it might decide that it has to take some actions and pay a near-term price in order to create something that is more enduring for the longer term that will defend Chinese interests. And I think that this is where the U.S. has the most concerns. The actions that China is taking now in the South China Sea, some of the military developments where China is seeking to develop capabilities that could make it very risky for the United States to intervene in a crisis, that is a trend that the U.S. is very worried about. In a few weeks, we have a new leader taking over in Taiwan, and this leader is from a party that is long stood for independence in Taiwan. And although the president-elect Tsai Ing-wen, I think, is not likely to pursue independence, one could imagine a series of developments that could take place on both sides of the Taiwan Strait that might lead that relationship to deteriorate. And under Xi Jinping, if China thinks that Taiwan might be slipping away, would he allow it? Is there a scenario in which China might use force against Taiwan? Very low probability, but very high risk and very worrisome to the United States. So those are the kinds of things that I think about going forward that will be litmus tests of Chinese foreign policy. Bonnie Glazer, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for interviewing me. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.